You've been in touch with that, Francis. Oh, Francis. Oh, can I share my screen? Maybe let me just start the, uh, do that. Uh, maybe I'll just okay. Screen share works great. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to the Lids seminar. We are very happy that finally managed to have uh, Professor Kamalika Chaudhary from uh, UC San Diego agree to speak in our seminar. And uh, Kamalika, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, Kamalika. She's currently an associate professor at UCSD. She got her PhD from UC Berkeley and she said after a small uh, postdoctoral stint, she then joined UCSD as a faculty. Uh, I think Kamlik, I met you once in San Diego, also not only at conferences. So uh, I still remember that. And uh, one of the recent things about Kamlika, I don't know how many, uh, many, maybe many of you who you know publish in machine learning will know, but uh, I still feel a little staggered that Kamlika agreed to chair two different machine learning conferences in one year, AI stats and ICML, and you survived that. So <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> That's a no mean task given everybody knows how monstrously large these conferences have become. Uh, and Kamlika is broadly interested in uh, both theoretical, practical types of top important topics in machine learning. And currently she's uh, quite a bit into this, uh, what is written here, reliable, trustworthy, and other such aspects of learning. And previously, I guess, come because so that, uh, that, that still fits within the theme of privacy and uh, such uh, crucial aspects within learning, including bias and whatnot. They are kind of all interrelated topics, maybe through one lens. I don't know if you're going to use that lens or what, so, but, but I'm looking forward to your take on these things. And uh, welcome, Kamlika. Floor is yours. Thank you, Subrit. Um, yeah, that was a very nice introduction. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, broadly called uh, reliable machine learning. So, oh, wait, this, oh, okay, now I'm good. I can, can you guys see my slides by any chance? Uh, you can, okay, good, excellent. So, um, so if you open a machine learning textbook, you know, this is kind of the first thing that you would see, right? You have training data which is drawn IID from uh, some data distribution that feeds into some classification algorithm, comes out a classifier, and that's evaluated on test data, which is again drawn IID from the same distribution, right? And usually when we are looking at, uh, you know, for most, uh, for most practical purposes, uh, we, uh, the classifier is good if it has high test accuracy on this test data that is drawn IID from this distribution. In reality, however, things are quite a bit different. So for example, uh, in reality, there are many other issues that happen when you try to deploy a, a, an actual machine learning classifier. Your classifier may not be robust. Uh, there might be a robust in the sense that if you change your outputs a little bit, or maybe if you are, you know, if you had clean images and now, you know, the your camera has, uh, I don't know, there's, there's some issue with the sensor, uh, everything goes haywire, right? Or maybe your data had some kind of um, sample selection bias, right? So when you collected your training data, maybe you ignored certain kinds of inputs and uh, now they show up in your test data. Another issue is privacy, uh, right? Because a lot of machine learning now is done on uh, sensitive data sets, right? So, uh, so these are a whole bunch of issues that shows up in reality. And what I and my group uh, work on is basically the foundations of a lot of these issues. So we try to model them uh, theoretically uh, and you know, either prove some theorems about them or design some algorithms based on our model uh, and so on, right? So this is kind of the broad umbrella um, uh, that uh, we uh, that we work with, uh, and today's talk, I'll talk about a couple of our recent work on uh, kind of two practical issues. Uh, one is robustness, and the other is overfitting. Okay, uh, so adversarial examples. Uh, so by robustness, uh, uh, I mean Kamlika. Quick thing: uh, Did you change any slide yet, or not yet? Just want to make sure because I don't oh, see any slide. You, you don't see any change slides. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, uh, we flipped. I flipped over at least uh, seven or eight slides. Oh wow! 
Okay, okay, let's let's see. Maybe you have to, yeah, just it felt like you are flipping through slides, but I'm not seeing that, so we should. Sorry, uh, okay, so sorry, guys, uh, I don't know. Uh, thank you. So, uh, we'll talk about kind of the uh, the theory behind a couple of practical issues. Uh, so uh, in that uh, shows up in machine learning. So, one is robustness, and the other is overfitting. Okay, so what do I mean by robustness? By robustness, I mean robustness to adversarial examples. And, you know, I mean, uh, by now, I'm sure everybody has seen these kinds of demos. These are basically small perturbations to legitimate inputs that can cause misclassification. So an example would be, you know, you see this image of the panda on the left. And what you do is you add 0 0.007 times the thing in the middle, which basically looks like, you know, random uh, noise to me. And then your neural network is very confident that this, uh, you know, that this image that you get, which, uh, you know, to me still looks like a panda, they're very confident that it's a given, right? And, uh, you know, and this kind of thing can potentially lead to serious safety issues. So for example, imagine instead of the image of a panda, if you were using this kind of a detector in your self-driving car and it saw a stop sign, and if, you know, if there was uh, some adversary who messed with, with the stop sign, the automate uh, the autonomous vehicle could uh, interpret it uh, as something else and this could lead to you know, serious uh, safety issues, okay? So what is known about adversarial examples? Well, in the literature, there's a very large number of attacks. So we know how to craft these kinds of uh, examples very, very well. There are also a few uh, defenses that work quite well. Um, however, uh, what is not as well understood is why they happen, right? So, you know, what's what's going on here? Why do we see these examples? Why they happen? And that is kind of what, what we'll talk about today, right? Kind of the foundations of why these adversarial examples are happening. So why would we have adversarial examples? Well, there might be three plausible answers and you know this kind of uh, you know if, like every learning theorist would recognize uh, this right so there are like three plausible answers so one is that your data distributions might overlap so what might happen is that the plus uh, you know so if you have let's say two classes plus and minus the plus class might be very close to the minus class in space so whatever you do you can't really hope to separate, uh, you know, you can't really hope to separate the pluses and the minuses. The other possibility is that, uh, let's say, you know, even if these classes are not close together in space, let's say these classes are um, relatively far apart, but what happens is we get too few samples from each class, right? When we are training our algorithm, we don't see enough samples from this class, so we don't really know what to do. And the third possibility, which is also kind of related to the second, is that we, uh, you know, maybe we have a lot of data. I mean, maybe it, it is fine, we have a lot of data, but but the algorithm that we are choosing to uh, build our classifiers, right, is at, at the end of the day, there's some training algorithm over there. Maybe that algorithm makes the wrong choice, right? Maybe the algorithm gives you uh, this blue classifier instead of the black one, and you know the black one would separate them uh, cleanly with a large margin, whereas the blue one doesn't uh, manage to do that. Okay. So uh, what we'll do next is we will go ahead and look at this problem in a little bit more detail. So actually, maybe what I'll do is I'll give you the answer right now. So the answer is actually number three, right? And what I'll do is uh, for the for the rest of, you know, for a large fraction of the talk, I'll, I'll try to uh, prove my point, right? That the answer is really, in, in a lot of cases, the answer really is number three. Okay, so what are we looking at? We are looking at the problem of classification. So, uh, you know, this is the very basics. You have feature vectors, Xi's and discrete labels, Yi's. And our goal is to find the prediction rule in a class that will predict the Y's from the X's, okay? And we are, and you know, Generally, the classical learning theory, in classical learning theory, people have always worked in the statistical learning framework. And what this framework does is that it tells you that your training and test data are both drawn from some underlying distribution. And there our goal is to find a classifier F that would maximize the accuracy. 
So what is the accuracy? The accuracy is uh, the fraction uh, of, uh, you know, labeled examples drawn according to data distribution D under which F of X is equal to Y, right? So the fraction of examples where uh, F of X will agree with the label that you see. Okay, and uh, we are also going to talk about robustness here. So we say that a classifier F is robust with radius S at a point X if for the distance metric, metric D, so suppose we have some distance metric D, then if the distance between X and X prime is at most S, that means that F of X is equal to F of X prime, right? In other words, if you have a point X, then you predict the same thing. Your classifier is going to predict the same thing in a ball of radius S around it, right? So, you know, um, so here, for example, these solid uh, circles are these points X. And then uh, robustness means that in those, uh, you know, kind of transparent balls, you are predicting the same thing, right? And what this means is that there is no adversarial example around X. And what we will look at in this talk is a couple of metrics. So one would be the adversarial accuracy, which is our accuracy against adversarial examples at radius S. And also we will care about clean accuracy because, you know, the, the, the trivial thing to do, the most robust classifier is the one that always predicts the same label. It's perfectly robust, but also perfectly useless. So we don't kind of want to get into that. And so we also care about clean accuracy. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's start out by looking at uh, robustness in uh, neural networks, right? So, um, sorry, something happened with my slides. Okay, here you go, sorry. Uh, let's, let's start out by looking at robustness in neural networks. Right. So here we are going to look at an abstraction of neural networks where, you know, a neural network is going to compute a function f of x and um, and the classifier is going to output the sign of f of x. Right. And what we are going to see over here is that the low, uh, the robustness will come from local smoothness. So if f is locally Lipschitz around a point x and f of x is bounded away from zero, then f is robust at x. Okay. Uh, so what is known for neural networks? Again, there's a large number of attacks. There's a few good defenses. However, all the defenses that we know of uh, show a robustness versus accuracy trade-off. Uh, and this happens the minute you get to slightly complicated data sets. So for very simple data sets like MNIST or, you know, like simpler uh, data sets, this doesn't all this happen, but the minute you get to slightly complicated data sets, you begin to see a robustness versus accuracy trade-off. And the question that we are going to ask ourselves is that, is this trade-off inevitable? And what I hope to convince you today is, at least is in principle, uh, you know, that's, that's not the case in principle, at least for real data, okay? The kind of data that we see in practice, this shouldn't be the case in principle, okay? Okay. So to uh, convince you, let me start out uh, with a definition, which is, uh, you know, the kind of data uh, which um, uh, characterizes the kind of data that we are talking about, right? And, the def and uh, this definition is that of R separation. We say that a data distribution is R separated if for any pairs X, Y, and X prime, Y prime drawn from the distribution, Y not equal to Y prime means that the distance between X and X prime is at least two R, right? So what this means is that if you have two points with different labels, they're at least distance two R apart, okay? And why is this interesting? The reason why R separation is interesting is because if your data distribution is R separated, then you can get uh, both robustness and accuracy, right? Then there exists a classifier that's perfectly robust and accurate. And not just that, what we can show is that this classifier can be obtained by rounding a locally smooth function, right? So if you have an underlying, uh, you know, continuous locally smooth function, and if you round it, you will get, um, you know, you will get, uh, you can get a classifier like this, okay? So uh, what does this mean for real data? So, you know, there's this definition of R separation and so on, but uh, what does this mean for real data? So, well, uh, in uh, practice- Amelika, sorry, uh, uh, quick question here. 
So the result you mentioned is an existence result, but of course it does not mean that one can computationally construct such a classifier, right? That is absolutely true. Okay. That is absolutely true. This is an existence result, that okay. there exists such a thing. In okay. principle, there exists such a thing. Um, we can also um, find such a classifier for real data sets by sort of cheating. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are achievable by existing neural network architectures, mm -hmm. but not with the current training methods that we have. Interesting, I see. Uh, so it's not the lack of expressivity, it's more just those training methods. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so, uh, so, okay, so excellent. So, uh, so what does this mean for real data? Well, uh, so the question is what happens with real data, right? Like a uh, real data, is it, uh, you know, do we see this kind of thing or is it just an idea? Well, so, so we tried to do, you know, do some measurements and we picked uh, these four real data sets, uh, MNIST, Cypher 10, uh, SVHN and Restricted ImageNet where uh, people do a lot of these adversarial examples experiments. And what we found is that these are in fact are separated. Right. So here I am looking at the separation, which is the minimum distance between any two points in dif uh, different classes. Right. And S is the typical robustness radius that is used in the experiments. OK. And what we found was that, you know, you can look at the numbers for MNIST and Cypher 10, uh, the separation. So this is we are measuring this in L infinity metric, which is, again, you know, one of the standards things that people do. Uh, what we found that the 2R usually is much higher than this, uh, you know, so real data is really quite R separated. For SVHN and restricted ImageNet, you can see a star uh, and an asterisk next to it. And so in SVHN, what happens is it has two examples which are exactly the same, but they have the same label. So if you remove these two examples, then you will get something like this. And restricted image, it also has a few, um, I think maybe three, so definitely less than five such highly noisy examples. So if you remove these five examples, then you will find that it becomes R separated. Okay, and so so what this means is that in principle, at least, um, uh, we sh there exists a classifier that uh, should be both robust and accurate, uh, and in principle, there shouldn't be any robustness accuracy trade off. In practice, however, there is one. Right. So what accounts for this gap? Okay, so to understand this, what we did is we did um, a quick empirical study. We looked at you know these four standard image data sets. We looked at a bunch of uh, models and a few, uh, and a bunch of different training methods. And in each case, what we did was we measured local smoothness accuracy, as well as adversarial accuracy, which is the accuracy on adversarial examples, okay? And uh, the question that we were uh, trying to ask is that, is local smoothness correlated with robustness? And here is kind of uh, some uh, a typical result for what we found. And this is for Cypher 10, but you know, this is fairly typical. So what we saw was that there were two groups of algorithms. So the first one is, you know, of course, natural training, there's something called gradient regularization, and locally linear regularization. And then there is uh, a second group of algorithm, which is uh, robust self-training and, you know, of course, adversarial training and traits. So overall, what we found was that in the first group, which is the red group over here, uh, adversarial accuracy was low. The Lipschitz constant was high and higher Lipschitz constant means less smooth. Um, and the generalization gap was relatively low. Whereas in the second group, what happened was the actual accuracy was low, the adversarial accuracy was much higher, and the Lipschitz constant was much lower. So these are smoother methods. Uh, their adversarial accuracy is higher, their accuracy, clean accuracy is lower, and uh, sorry. And uh, what we found is that the generalization gap for, sorry, the generalization gap for these, uh, the red methods is uh, usually tends to be much lower than the generalization gap for these uh, gray methods, right? So what this shows is that these smoother methods actually end up having quite 
quite a bit of generalization gap. Then we tried experimenting with a bunch of uh, things to see, you know, for example, we looked at whether dropout can help generalization. Uh, and we tried to look at a, lot, a bunch of these, uh, you know, these gray algorithms, and then we applied uh, dropout on top of them. And um, what we... Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Kaunika, could you briefly comment on uh, how is the Lipschitz constant being computed or what is it a Lipschitz constant of? Excellent question. Uh, so the Lipschitz constant here is the um, is the Lipschitz constant. Uh, it's the average over the uh, test input. So you take a test point and you look for the local Lipschitz constant in a ball around it. Okay, mm -hmm. and here the way we computed it was through um, something called PGD, which is projected gradient descent. So, which is an adversarial example attack, but mm -hmm. we used a lot more steps than we used in training the algorithm. So, it's a so this is a constant of the neural network function, uh, That's like good. the yeah. neural network seen as a nonlinear map, basically. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So this is, you know, again, this is a bit of an underestimate because I don't know, uh, maybe there are newer methods which can, uh, I, I don't think you can get the exact one. There are oh, underestimates sure. and overestimates. So this is a, an underestimate. Um, oh. But it's it's more powerful than what we trained it with. So mm -hmm. it gives you a better picture. Um, Thanks. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, a uh, good question. And so we, we tried dropout and what we found was that it helped a little bit in reducing the generalization gap, uh, but not a lot. So overall, uh, what we find by looking at these methods is that the smoother methods are more robust than the less smooth methods. The smoother methods also have a large generalization gap. Right and uh, dropout reduces the generalization gap by a little bit, uh, not too much. Uh, and so, what is happening for neural networks is that uh, you know real data is R separated, so robust and accurate networks exist. However, the problem is that the current algorithms are not finding them possibly because uh, they are not generalizing well enough. And so what we need to focus on, it's, it's at least our opinion, is better methods for adversarial generalization. So, you know, maybe things like dropout, um, other things, maybe architecture search. So maybe the current architectures are more geared towards non-robust classification. Maybe we need newer architectures, uh, algorithms, uh, you know, in deep learning of uh, also the algorithms, um, you know, determine generalization sometimes, right? SGD has has different properties than Adam. So, you know, so those are some things we need to look at here. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, uh, so coming back to this, uh, you know, this picture, which uh, we had started with for neural networks, what we found is that the issue is possibly, uh, you know, it's at least not one, the data distributions don't overlap. The issue is possibly number three. Okay. Uh, okay, so next uh, we will take uh, a look at uh, non-parametric methods, right? And we'll go ahead and ask the same question for non-parametric methods where things are a little bit more tractable and they're a little bit better analyzable. So what, what do I mean by non-parametric methods? Uh, what I mean is, you know, methods like, you know, k-nearest neighbors, decision trees, random forests, uh, kernels, things like that, okay? So what is known about these methods in general? Well, um, you know, there is something called the Bayes optimal classifier, right? So the Bayes optimal classifier is the classifier which has the highest accuracy on the data distribution. And, you know, this is a limit object in the sense that you can't really get at it with a finite uh, number of data points, but it's reachable in the uh, infinite sample limit, right? So as we get more and more data, uh, you know, if our algorithms are good enough, hopefully we will come close to the base optimal, okay? So, uh, so what is known about non-parametric methods? Well, there's a theorem, there's a you know, very classical theorem by Stone in 1977, which is before even I was born, let alone my students. And uh, what this theorem shows is that as we get more and more training data, right? So as the training data size grows, the accuracy of a lot of these non-parametric methods would converge to the accuracy of the base optimal. So, you know, things like k nearest neighbor, if you set k in the right way or decision trees, 
if you partition things in, you know, in certain ways, would converge to the accuracy of the base optimum. Okay. Well, what about robustness? So for robustness, uh, the first thing we should ask is, well, uh, what is the limit of robust classification, right? So just as we had the Bayes optimal, what should be the analog of, uh, of the Bayes optimal? And if you look closely, uh, the Bayes optimal is in fact undefined outside the support of your data distribution, right? So, uh, so here our data distribution is supported on these uh, red and uh, gray blobs, right? But outside the, these data distribution, the you know the Bayes optimal could behave in any way it likes. And in fact, if you look at these two blue curves that I have drawn, both of these are you know valid Bayes optimal, right? Like they could do whatever outside, and those are both valid Bayes optimal. But if you look at them closely what you will realize is that none of them are actually robust because they just pass too close to the uh, decision boundary, right? So, uh, so what would be the limit? So we define such a limit and we call it the R optimal. So R optimal is the classifier that instead of maximizing accuracy, which the base optimal, you know, remember it maximizes accuracy on the data distribution, the R optimal maximizes robust accuracy. Okay, and uh, for distributions that are R separated, so here is what it looks like for distributions that are R separated, but you can uh, also define it for other distributions. It's more complicated, it's like really messy, but it works. So for R separated distribution, uh, here is what the R optimal, where, or rather here is what an AR optimal would look like. You predict plus, if the distance between your input point and the support of the pluses is at most r, you predict minus otherwise. So this is an r optimal. The r optimal again may not be unique, uh, and this is what uh, an, an r optimal would look like for an r separated distribution. Okay. So okay. So coming back. Uh, to non-parametric methods, well, what can we say about their convergence properties? And it turns out that we can, in fact, find their convergence properties, right? So we prove a theorem that outlines their convergence properties. Uh, but the interesting thing is, you know, I mean, uh, so we can outline the exact conditions and it ends up being a little bit stronger than, you know, convergence to the Bayes optimal. But the interesting thing is what satisfies it. So if you look at the uh, look at our properties closely, what you find is that nearest neighbors and kernel classifiers, they would converge to the R optimal for R separated data sets, uh, you know, as n goes to infinity. However, there are other classifiers like histograms and decision trees, which would converge to the Bayes optimal, but not the R optimal. Right. And, you know, this is, um, you know, so this is, uh, you know, this is kind of slightly surprising. And so, so what happens over here? So maybe I can convince you that this is possible uh, with an example. So, uh, so suppose you're trying to build a decision tree. So here is the example which shows why they don't converge, right? So let's say you're supposed, uh, you're trying to build a decision tree and the red and the gray slabs are your data points, right? So, if you have a standard decision tree algorithm like CART or ID tree, what you would do is when you find this blue line, you're going to stop, right? Because this blue line perfectly classifies the red from the gray and you're done. Uh, however, this blue line is actually not going to be robust, right? And you know your decision tree algorithm would just stop. Even if you had an infinite number of data, it wouldn't do anything, right? And so you will be stuck with this blue line. However, there is a robust decision tree, right? The robust decision tree is the one which has this kind of jagged black boundary. Uh, however, with our current decision tree algorithms, at least, uh, you know, the ones that we, um, you know, that we currently use for building decision trees, uh, those are not going to find this uh, robust decision boundary, right? So they are going to stop with the blue line, even if they have an infinite amount of data, and they're just going to be done, right? So what uh, this convinces us, uh, coming back to our original point, what this convinces us is that uh, robustness depends a lot on the training algorithm. 
right? So, uh, so, uh, so what we see over here in conclusion is, um, you know, you can have, uh, so what we do is we propose the R optimal, which is the analog of the Bayes optimal. So this is the large sample limit for robust classification. This is what we are hoping to achieve if we have infinite resources. We show that nearest neighbors and kernels converge to R optimal for separated data, for R separated data, but not decision trees, right? And so what we see, uh, what this tells us is that even for non-parametrics, robustness also depends on the properties of the training algorithm, okay? Okay, so uh, now, uh, un unless there are any questions on robustness, maybe uh, now this is the time when I'm going to switch to my next topic, uh, which was uh, overfitting. Okay, so uh, what do I mean by overfitting? Well, you know, I mean, uh, there's been a, a huge proliferation of these, uh, of the deep generative models, and they have been highly successful, right? So they can generate very uh, photorealistic images. They're being used all over the place. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they, they've really literally been highly, highly successful, right? And the question that we are trying to ask uh, ourselves is, is do they overfit? And before I can get to it, uh, let's first talk about what uh, overfitting means, okay? So what do I mean by overfitting? Uh, so here is an example of the kind of overfitting we are trying to catch, right? So let's say I have our data set, and this is, you know, kind of motivated by some real applications. So one of the things that people have been trying to do now that uh, these de deep generative models are so effective in, um, you know, in, uh, in modeling very complicated distributions is generate synthetic data for, uh, you know, for privacy purposes, right? So the idea is that you have some data set of patients and you don't want to release it to researchers because of various privacy concerns. So what you do is you train a GAN on it and you release synthetic patients based on this GAN, right? And now the question is, um, you know, I mean, you could claim that, look, I mean, this is the output of a model. There is no real patient here, uh, but there could be a problem if your GAN ends up just, uh, you know, resampling just the training data, right? So you don't know what your GAN is doing, but potentially what your GAN could do is it could take a random patient and it could just release its data, right? And if that is, uh, that's happening, then uh, this would be a serious privacy concern, uh, especially in, you know, for these kinds of applications, right? So this is an example. Um, Another example, which, uh, you know, somebody told me about when I was giving a talk was that, you know, there are these days, there are these websites uh, of GAN generated faces, and uh, they claim that this person does not exist. But, uh, you know, nobody knows if that person exists in the training data, because the training data is so large, nobody, you know, has the time to go through all of the images in there. So, you know, so that's that that would be another example of overfitting where, you know, you don't know if these models are essentially, uh, you know, sampling the training data points, making maybe very small modifications to them, and then releasing these uh, results. Okay. So, okay, so let's, uh, so how can we formalize this problem? Uh, let's start out by looking at the setting. Okay, so here uh, is our setting. We have some training data, which is, you know, again, drawn from some underlying distribution. This is fed into a generative model. And, you know, uh, so this training data goes into some algorithm and, you know, we, we get a generative model, which is built on the training data, right? And then this generative model will generate some data, right? So you can draw some samples from this generative model. And uh, how do you evaluate these samples? Well, to evaluate these samples, uh, you have a test data set, which is drawn again, IID from the same underlying data distribution. And somehow you combine the training data, the generated data and the test data into an evaluation score, okay? So uh, what does it mean to overfit in this setting? Well, this is kind of the classical view of overfitting, right? So what you do is you build some model and you know you can have the likelihood. So you can calculate the likelihood of the training data 
given model, as well as the likelihood of the test data given model. And if there is a large gap between the training likelihood and the test likelihood, then what you can say is that you are overfitting, right? So the likelihood of the test data is not as high and the likelihood of the training data is very high. So, you know, chances are that you're overfitting, okay? Okay. So, um, so where does this, uh, you know, where does this uh, fall through? Well, when we talk about uh, kind of more uh, complicated uh, deep generative models, sometimes your likelihood may be intractable, right? So there, you know, the, 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 uh, the measure I just uh, talked about uh, depends very much on being able to calculate the likelihood. Well, that likelihood may be intractable. You may not be able to calculate it. An example of that is in VAEs. Uh, another uh, issue that might happen is that you may not even have a likelihood, right? So for example, in GANs, you don't really have a likelihood. I mean, there are ways of assigning a likelihood on top of GANs, but it's, uh, you know, but it's um, a little bit clunky. And what you have is only samples. Right. And in these cases, you know, overfitting may be quite a bit of a concern because, you know, these models have lots and lots of parameters. So, you know, it's, it's not implausible that they might be overfitting. OK. So what we'll do next is uh, we'll look at this problem and we will start out by um, talking about uh, or rather separating out two formal notions of overfitting. Okay, and just uh, give me a moment to explain them, and then uh, I will uh, I'll, I'll tell you where they fit, in, right? And the two formal notions, uh, and this was kind of our main contribution was to kind of separate out these two formal notions, uh, are overrepresentation and data copying. So that's what we are going to call them. Okay, so what does overrepresentation mean? Okay. Suppose you have some training data and some generated data. You say that we are over your generative model is suffering from overrepresentation in a region C if the probability uh, that X lies in C under the generated data uh, on, in the under the generative model is much higher than uh, the fraction of points that lie in C from the training distribution, right? So what does this mean? Uh, in you know very simple terms, let's say you know if you look at the square or the rectangle at the top, at the top rectangle you see there are you know two training points, but there are a lot of generated points, right? So that is uh, overrepresentation. And you know for people who are kind of familiar with this literature, it's kind of the opposite of uh, mode dropping, or uh, it's the opposite of mode dropping, right? So uh, what you are doing is uh, so or you know another example would be let's say your data has had 20% uh, cats and somehow your generated model generates 70% cats, right? So then you would be overfit, uh, you, you would be overrepresented. Okay, so this is overrepresentation. A second notion, uh, which is somewhat orthogonal of uh, overfitting is what we call uh, data copying. Okay, what does data copying mean? Suppose we have some underlying distance metric D we are data copying in a region C if, let's say we have, uh, you know, we have a bunch of uh, points drawn from the generative model and a bunch of points drawn from the uh, test, uh, you know, an independent test sample from the underlying distribution, right? If your generated models are closer on an average to your training data, then to then, test samples uh, than IID test samples, then you are data copying, okay? An extreme example of this is imagine a generative model that just uh, bootstraps samples the training data, right? It draws a random sample from the training data and just releases it, right? That would be an example of data copying because if you look at the distance between uh, this point and its closest training point, that is zero. Whereas if you took an independent IID test sample, then the distance between each IID test sample and its closest training point on an average, that would not be zero, right? That would be something non-zero. Right, so this is an example of data copying, and you know this is kind of an extreme example of data copying, right? Like this is like the worst data copying that ever is. Uh, you can also have more benign data copying. So what you could do is you could draw a training sample, maybe you add a little bit of tiny bit of noise to it, and then you release it, right? So that would be a slightly more um, 
you know, you draw a training sample, you change a few pixels and you release it, right? So that would be a slightly more uh, benign form of data copying, okay? And uh, over-representation uh, that uh, we just talked about uh, is actually not data copying. So these are in fact very orthogonal concepts. So for example, uh, so here is like a simple example. Let's say you have a mixture of three Gaussians, you know, 33, uh, one third, one third, one third. You pick up two of them, your generative model picks up two of them and goes 50 50, right? That is an example of over representation, but not data copying because you know you are generalizing well within those uh, Gaussians. Uh, you're just over representing them, right? You're not really copying on the training data. Okay. On the other hand, uh, if you have, uh, you know, again, your data comes from a mixture of three Gaussians, uh, what you do is you just copy out your training data, right? You release your training data or you modify your training data by just a tiny bit and release it. That would be data copying without over representation because you're not really you know, just uh, over-representing any like large enough uh, region of the space, you're just, uh, you know, you're just copying out your, you know, you're essentially just um, releasing your training data or slight modifications thereof, okay? So again, uh, prior to our work, there's uh, there's been a lot of of existing hypothesis tests uh, that would detect uh, overfitting in generative models. Uh, and, you know, these are just some examples. There are many, many more. And I, uh, you know, if I miss some of your work, I apologize. Uh, there's many, many more. The interesting thing here is almost all of them, except one, test for overrepresentation, and they fail to detect even exact data copying. So if you had an algorithm which was just releasing the training set, uh, all these models would say, okay, these are all fine. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're fine. They're fine in terms of overfitting. They're not overfitting at all. Okay. So, uh, so this was uh, kind of the state of the art before, uh, before our work. So, uh, and, Monica, yes, sorry. so just a small comment here. Yeah which kind of is uh, interesting in the context of supervised learning, where if you think in terms of nearest neighbors, then data copying is the right thing to do. Here yes. the concern becomes flipped. Yes, 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 yes. So I guess one of the points of this uh, talk and one of the things that we realized is that, you know, um, we always think about generalization in unsupervised learning kind of, you know, uh, like in supervised learning in times of log likelihood gap. But when we talk about these like really large unsupervised models, the problem is actually a little bit more complex. It's not mm -hmm. as simple as, right? There are all these aspects to it. Yeah. <laughs> which are quite, um, I don't know, which are quite interesting, which I find quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, so now that we have these two formal notions of overfitting, uh, can we talk about a test to detect data copying? And we can come up with a simple test, uh, which we can come come up with it uh, from the definition, right? So, uh, so the simplest thing to do is you look at, uh, you know, you have your test data, you have your generated data and training data. You look at the average distance between a test example and its closest training point, the average distance between a generated example and its closest training point, and you look at uh, if this gap is uh, higher than, you know, is much higher than zero. You can, um, you know, you can do your usual hypothesis test of whether this gap is much higher than zero, right? The problem with this test is that uh, you can end up with high variance, particularly from outliers, right? So these, uh, you know, here you are uh, comparing exact distances and you may have some outliers which might introduce a high variance, okay? So uh, what, how can you resolve this? Well, it turns out that there are, there's a very simple way of resolving it, where instead of comparing uh, the average distance, what you do is you do kind of a ranking test, right? So uh, what you do is you compare how many times do uh, the, you know, how many times are the test points uh, closer than the generated points, right? How many times are the distances between the test points and the training points closer than the distances between the generated points and the training points, right? And if you look at this, uh, you know, if you squint at this for a few minutes, um, essentially what happens is that this reduces to the, uh, the man Whitney test on distances between P and, uh, you know, distances between the test samples and their closest training points and the generated samples and their closest training points. 
right? So if you look at all these distances and if you do the man, uh, so this basically reduces to the man Whitney test on one, okay? Uh, and you know, this is a you know, very standard uh, non-parametric statistical test, okay? So, okay, so that uh, kind of gives us a simple test. Uh, however, there is another uh, kind of big problem when you try to apply them on these deep generative models. And the problem is the, uh, is the heterogeneity. So usually in generative, you know, this kind of big models, what will happen is that, you know, different parts of the data is different, right? The data uh, space is different. You might have a model which is kind of um, data copying on cats, but, uh, you know, doing something else on dogs and maybe dropping the fishes and you know underfitting somewhere else so the question is how can we account for this heterogeneity and if we don't account for this heterogeneity then global tests might end up failing uh, because of this kind of you know very heterogeneous reason okay so um uh, and as it turns out the way to do this is uh, in fact quite simple and uh, the way we do it is we use kind of a classical um, algorithmic tool in non parametric uh, statistics which is uh, binning so we divide the space into cells uh, into cells and the way we do this is uh, through clustering and we make sure each uh, each cell has uh, you know enough data points because if there are too few data points you can't do a statistical test and then we do our test in each cell and then we put everything together by uh, looking at the weighted average of the one-sided test results right and then if the uh, the weighted average is too high then what we can do is we can look inside its cell and do the test in each cell to figure out what went wrong in a particular cell okay so uh, so putting these all together gives us a kind of a full statistical test okay so how does this uh, test work? How well does it detect data copying? Uh, to uh, understand this, we will, uh, I'll, I'll talk about, I mean, we have more experiments in our paper, so I'll, I'll talk about kind of two case studies. So one is a VAE on MNIST, and here what we are doing is that we are increasing the latent dimension from one to underfit to 100, where it's uh, really data copying. And this was kind of, um, uh, so uh, other people had kind of observed, I mean, they detect overfitting in other ways, but other people had observed that when the latent dimension of a VAE on MNIST goes to, uh, goes to 100, then, um, you know, then there, there are other kinds of overfitting. So we are just kind of trying to see uh, what happens over here, okay? And the metric that we use is uh, uh, the 64 dimensional latent space of an autoencoder, which was trained with the VGGNet perceptual law. So which is, you know, again, one of uh, kind of the standard things people use uh, in this case. And um, here are some of the results that we see. Okay, so uh, what is happening over here is as we go from uh, left to right, we are going from overfitting to underfitting, right? Overfitting as in data copying to underfitting, right? Uh, and um, so what we are looking at is uh, uh, we have two other baselines. So our test is this uh, CT. So this is the one which is, I guess, right and top, right? That's, the, that's our test. And we are looking at two other baselines. So one is the generalization gap. The generalization gap is the uh, gap between the, um, uh, basically the, the training elbow minus the test elbow or, uh, you know, the gap between the training and test elbow. So in this is VAE, so we can't really get the exact likelihood. We looked at the elbow. Uh, and then the third baseline is something called uh, the nearest neighbor test. So nearest neighbor test is actually, you know, uh, if you remember, I said, all of the tests um, are testing for overrepresentation except one. So that is the nearest neighbor test. So the nearest neighbor test is actually, uh, you know, uh, it's very good at detecting exact data copying. So what it does is it, it looks at, uh, you know, the nearest neighbor in the generated set versus the training set. And, you know, it does something like that. And it's very good at detecting exact data copying. However, they are also global. And so what happens is they, uh, if things are heterogeneous, then they can, uh, that might affect their score. So that's, uh, that's kind of the issue with the nearest neighbor test. Uh, 
Okay, so the nearest neighbor test, you can see that it does reasonably in the sense that it does detect that as we go from, uh, you know, overfitting to underfitting, something is changing. They detect uh, these things. So these are the, you know, the three lines are the three versions of the test. So they detect it, uh, but, but not as well. So ideally at 0.5 should be, uh, you know, 0.5 is where sh things should be fit exactly, but, you know, as you can see, they are always above 0.5. Um, uh, the second case study we do is uh, the big GAN. Uh, again, we don't have the we don't have the resources to train the big GAN. You know, we are a small academic group. But what we do is we take a trained copy of the big GAN, and then we use so which is trained on the ImageNet, and we use the um, uh, the ImageNet test set, and we look at three classes, and two of these are kind of default classes. In uh, you know, if you download the big GAN, then two of these are default classes. The third is a random class um, that was picked. Um, a random class with an object in the foreground that my student picked. Okay. And uh, Big Gan has something called uh, a truncation threshold, which measures the generated sample complexity. Okay. Uh, so, um, and uh, and so, so the big N has, you know, this parameter. And so we vary that parameter. Uh, and then the metric D that we use is the 64 dimensional PCA of the inception space. Okay. And again, here is what we see. So as the truncation threshold increases, we are again going from um, overfitting on this side to underfitting on this other side, right? So overfitting on uh, the left to underfitting on the right. As the truncation threshold increases, here what happens is that the nearest uh, neighbor, um, you know, the nearest neighbor uh, metric remains more or less the same. It doesn't show that much of a change. In our case, we see our, uh, our score does show a change, right? So as, um, as the truncation threshold increases, uh, we see a bit of, you know, our score does uh, indicate that there is some amount of, uh, you know, uh, overfitting to underfitting going on and uh, and our kind of the threshold where the perfect fit is is at zero right that, that's what uh, you know that's uh, that's at zero and here is kind of an example of what happens so what i'm showing you are uh, uh, the the top uh, table is a data copied cell right is a cell that our method detects as data copying and um, the real images are test images and the the second row is generated images right and then the bottom uh, kind of table is a non data copied cell and so what you can see is that in the data copied cell, essentially the same coffee cup keeps appearing over and over again. Uh, whereas in the non-data copied cell, uh, at least, you know, visually these images seem a lot more diverse. The, the coffee cups that you see, they end up being a lot more diverse. Whereas in the data copied cell, you know, this, uh, this coffee cup, and these are randomly generated samples, uh, they keep appearing over and over again. Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, um, yeah, so that's that's uh, you know that gives you some idea. So in uh, conclusion, uh, what we did over here was we looked at a new three sample test for this uh, notion of overfitting called data copying, and we formalized the two notions of overfitting. Uh, and uh, and um, so there, uh, these are uh, some references. Uh, but overall, um, I think the interesting thing over here is that when we try to look at uh, these kinds of you know, overfitting in these kinds of, uh, you know, large generative models, uh, there, there's more to it than just, you know, test and training likelihood. And things are just uh, really interesting and complicated. And, uh, you know, we should probably take uh, closer looks at that. So these are our papers. Uh, the first three are on robustness. And uh, the last one is on data copying. And finally, I'll just end with uh, the picture of um, the people who did most of the work. And I can take your questions. Thank you, Kamalika, for your uh, very clear talk. And we have time for a couple of short questions. Uh, the hour is almost over. So uh, audience, please uh, welcome to ask questions right now. Let's wait a bit. 
in case anybody has any questions or comments. Okay. I always have questions, uh, but uh, I was just wanted to give a brief chance to anybody else who feels <laughs> brave. You know, uh, not everybody feels so brave on Zoom asking questions somehow, mm -hmm. even though I'm sure everybody has questions. So uh, in the, uh, just a quick uh, question to make sure I understood the plot right. In the CT plot that you showed, so basically you're say, saying that the test that you develop is able to detect uh, copying better or like what, what is the kind of takeaway of that CT plot? Yeah, this and the next one. Uh, this and the next one. Yeah. Uh, the takeaway is that um, as we, right, so takeaway is that uh, as we go from uh, over uh, overfitting to underfitting, mm -hmm. the test is able to detect that one that we are going from overfitting to underfitting. So the issue with, uh, okay, so the other thing I will also say is that with this kind of real data, it's very hard. I mean, unless you actually look at the examples to say that there was actually data copy. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, uh, you know, we can't claim to make that point. What we can claim to make is that it is detecting this kind of, you know, overfitting versus, uh, you know, some form of overfitting versus underfitting, right? Like the model complexity grows, it has a score that grows, okay? We also have some other experiments in our paper where we looked at uh, kernel density estimation. Right? Mm -hmm. So there you can actually, if your sigma is very, very small, you are essentially data copying. Mm -hmm. So there we were able to show that our test could you know, detect data copying and uh, it could, you know, if you, um, so there you could find the optimum sigma by looking at the validation point, right? Mm -hmm. uh, using a validation data set, you can find the optimum sigma and then, and there, you know, and uh, where you, where we crossed this uh, threshold, the zero threshold, that was very close to the optimum sigma. But I guess there's many other related questions that one could ask in the sense that here data copying really means copying, say, the whole image, whereas actually copying may happen in fractions and subparts. Yeah. And some of that copying is maybe called learning. So it depends in which setting you are, whether you if that is acceptable or not. But uh, I, I was just wondering about kind of that uh, tussle mm -hmm. because there is this uh, tension between wanting copying and not wanting copying. But, right, uh, right, right. So there, you know, here we are kind of shoving it under the rug by uh, just uh, assuming that the metric is going to deal with it. Uh, because there's this underlying metric uh, that is, uh, you know, we are just kind of assuming that's going to deal with it. But you are absolutely right. And it's also there are yeah, I feel like uh, there are like various other aspects of this thing. As you pointed out, there, there might be parts might be copied, parts might not be um, yeah, and yeah, I, I agree with you. And uh, it's, uh, I, I feel like that this problem is uh, like measuring quality of samples drawn from generative models is a very multidimensional problem. Right, right. So because part of the reason why I mentioned that I wanted to bring that up was that the, depending on the application, you may end up being too conservative at declaring that copying has happened because it's still, at that point, it will start becoming subjective unless it's exactly uh, nearest neighbor of itself. But otherwise, yeah, I guess. Uh, it, so there's plenty of scope for additional such uh, statistical tests, I guess, than in this yes. domain. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, this is kind of just a start. And you're absolutely right. So I actually had a con conversation with uh, some folks who do uh, computer vision, and they were saying that some amount of copying is in fact desirable when you are generating realistic images because mm -hmm. you, you want some of that. Right. Okay, amongst anybody else, if there is a question, this is your chance to ask. Well, uh, if not, I guess I, I will volunteer that uh, you can reach out to Kamalika to ask any questions. <laughs> <yourself>. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Uh, well, th uh, thank you very again for uh, uh, thank you again for a very uh, clear and understandable talk, Kamalika.
Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.